Welcome to IdeaGen TV. Today we are thrilled to have with us Mark Fitzgerald, Global Head of KPMG's International Development Assistance Services. Mark, welcome. George, always a pleasure. Delighted to be here. Uh, as you know, KPMG highly values our sharing platform with IdeaGen. Anytime we can discuss issues that are pertinent to the global community, we're happy to do so. Thank you so much, Mark. And I know you're leading efforts globally uh, to change the world. And we are committed to global partnerships for world change. And therefore, it's exciting to have you on IdeaGen today to speak specifically about the global goal number eight, decent work and economic growth is part of the 17 days of sustainability. Mark, to kick off the interview, would you kindly tell us a little bit about how KPMG is helping to progress goal number eight of the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Thank you, George. And, um, what this allows us to do is reflect on the 17 goals. And I'm just going to take a moment to read the full headline on the list of the eight. Uh, I think we all get very familiar uh, with the, uh, the numbers and, and the taglines for the goals. The full title is Remote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. So if you break that down into the different parts of that full title, uh, there are many, many uh, elements. Uh, and what we find with the SDGs, when we move from a number to seven with the MDGs to 17 with the SDGs, a lot of people felt that that was somehow diluting or, or not bringing enough prioritization to the key uh, global issues of the day in 2015 when we were launched. But when you actually break them down and you look at the mosaic and how they interact with one another, yes, we need to focus on one particular SDG uh, and have uh, elements of, of support and uh, attraction against the targets underneath SDG uh, 8, but you have to look at the interconnection with all the other 16. Um, so, for example, you know, you can look at health, you can look at education, you can look at pathways and supply chains, you can look at infrastructure development, uh, energy production, uh, how that's distributed, how that generates economic growth. You can look at uh, workforce training or, or the lack thereof. You can look at the applicability of the demand uh, in terms of the uh, current economic uh, requirements uh, of a certain country, jurisdiction, and so forth, and are the educational uh, structures appropriate for that demand? Uh, you can look at the economic players uh, and the broader economic uh, environment. Are they conducive to sustained investment? And what would that investment look like? Is it going to be uh, focused on sustainability? Is it going to be focused on quality? Is it going to be focused on the inclusiveness uh, of the full population of that particular um, so you can go on and on and look at various aspects of SDG 8 uh, and understand that it applies across all of the other 16 uh, in multiple ways and vice versa. And that's what uh, we kind of reflect on when we look at all of the 17 goals. Uh, yes, we need to look at uh, each one individually, how it then plays off the others. So you do, you have a, an awareness of one uh, action has a corresponding positive action uh, across multiple goals. So you asked about uh, KPMG. Uh, we are very much aware uh, that we are global citizens. We are, uh, we have member firms right across the globe, 150 plus countries uh, and jurisdictions. Uh, we have 230,000 people. So in our own right, we have an obligation uh, to our own people uh, and the places that they operate and work in. And then when you look at uh, each member firm, how long they've been in those countries and been in those communities. And, and obviously for us to remain uh, employment uh, and have a productive presence in those communities, the economic growth uh, and prosperity of those countries is paramount to our business model. There is no uh, other way to look at it. Um, and then we also have elements of what does it mean to be a global citizen? We have issues around our own uh, engagement our own carbon footprint, our own uh, ways of, uh, of interaction with our the broader stakeholders. Um, and we also then have 
tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands of clients and what they do and how we advise them. So the actual uh, obligation on us is not just how we operate uh, as an entity or a, a network of entities around the world, but also the access we have uh, in terms of advice to our clients and the services we provide. And, you know, that interconnectedness of the goals is so critical uh, that you alluded to, Mark, because as you look at the glue that holds these goals together, it really is goal number 17, right? Which is these partnerships, which KPMG has a unique vantage point in that you're seeing all of the sectors, you're seeing trends, you're able to see around corners to help other sectors sort of prepare for or adjust to certain things that are happening across the planet, which is an incredibly valuable component of what you're providing to all of those companies and organizations, right? Partnerships are key. Uh, they always have been. Uh, I think what's happened, particularly during the pandemic, there's been an amplification of the importance of partnerships. The obvious one is uh, the public private partnership around the development of vaccines. Um, and, uh, and quite rightly so, the acceleration of how we were able to go from where we were in March of last year to, uh, to March of this year um, was really a testament to how partnerships can really provide uh, that impetus uh, for the broader benefits uh, to, to, the, to the local community. That's just one very evident example of partnerships. But you talked about the kind of the, the patchwork the ecosystem of all the various actors and if we then apply that to uh, the advancement and, and hopefully the ambition of the, of the sdgs in the next 10 or so years you have uh, public sector you have private sector you have civil society you have ngos you have uh, broader citizenship uh, in terms of how they uh, are heard uh, you have even uh, the rise of the individual um, clearly social media has had a huge in amplifying their voice. Um, and all of the above are people, entities, uh, communities that we engage with, either in our own right, uh, as a firm, as a member of those communities, but also uh, in terms of the provision of our services. So if we can join those dots in all of the above, in, in some capacity, um, not one entity, not one person is going to have the full answer. But when you start bringing those actors together, that convergence of actors that's been spoken about in the past, it amplifies uh, the power of those connections, those partnerships. And sometimes those partnerships can be informal, they can be just a network of the willing, uh, and sometimes they're very formal, like the vaccine for the moment, for example. Um, and all are useful and all have a huge role to play, uh, not just with us, G17, but across all of the 16. That's right, Mark. That That's incredible perspective. And I want to take a moment to thank you for all you're doing to join those dots, to connect those dots across the world. And apropos, we recently saw your 2021 CEO Outlook report, where Bill Thomas, global chairman and CEO of KPMG, said that CEOs are increasingly placing ESG at the heart of their recovery. Would you kindly share with our global audience how you all at KPMG are doing so? Well, thank you for noting that outlook. Uh, it's something we do as a firm every year. Uh, we survey and interview uh, up to 2,000 CEOs around the world uh, of entities of various sizes, uh, but certainly those that have that critical reach. Um, so what's interesting about uh, that particular uh, highlight this year, where ESG is very much front and center of the CEO's agenda for recovery and, and, and uh, what does a post pandemic environment look like for them. Um, but if you go back over the last two or three years, ESG was also uh, in the top three issues. Uh, so, both during the pandemic and pre pandemic as well. And the other layer I would add to this, George, is yes, we're talking to CEOs, and yes, this is of what's on their minds, but it also is very reflective of what the boards are focused on. Uh, of course, the 
relationship between these boards and, and the CEOs uh, is self-evident. Uh, but what we really noticed is boards uh, focus on prioritization on issues around environment, around social engagement. And what does the governance related to these two elements look like? Uh, and what does it mean for them as, as, a, as a company or a broader entity? Uh, and we've also seen a, a, a connection between ESG, uh, how, how it's interpreted within the global world, for example, and the SDGs. Um, if we go back to 2015 when we launched, there were a number of uh, good corporate actors out there from this could be a very well informed, very comprehensive set uh, of, of goals and frameworks that. You know, it's not self-interest. Uh, uh, it, it really is something that we can point to that was facilitated by the UN community, uh, and they can then monitor their own performance against what is relevant to them within the 17 goals and the best targets uh, indicators. Um, and that has accelerated dramatically uh, over the last two or three years. But uh, I, I think the ESG agenda uh, was it's been accelerated and amplified because of the pandemic. I think it had already reached a degree of momentum uh, before the pandemic, uh, and uh, we're now seeing companies understand the importance of these issues to their uh, sustained business models across the world. Incredible perspective, Mark. And in, in terms of goal number eight, uh, throughout your career, what have you seen as perhaps one of the biggest barriers? one of the biggest barriers in the progression for decent work, the focus on decent work, the, the impact of identifying, joining those dots, as you mentioned, for decent work and economic growth. George, we could spend hours talking about barriers to any one of the 17 goals. Uh, most of those barriers are well-documented uh, and at some times can feel very overwhelming depending on which issue you're focused on, which country you're in, um, and, and, and they run the gamut in terms of lack of infrastructure development, lack of financing, lack of political will, uh, resilience against climate change, uh, dysfunctional supply chain. You could go on and on uh, of all of the issues that clearly have a direct impact in terms of uh, that conducive environment development. So it's not just about work, it's about who gets to work. So I, I, the way I would summarize it though is the biggest barrier I have noticed over 30 years or so uh, is a lack of opportunity um, and how that is manifests itself uh, in terms of an individual where they what environment they currently find themselves in is different obvious reasons. Um, but when you look at that mosaic, you look at that patchwork of issues, uh, are they healthy? Do they have access to good education? Do they have you know, access to decent uh, sanitation? Do they have access to uh, appropriate mentors and students, stewards of their lives? Do they have access to uh, the opportunities that many others take for granted? If you create those pathways, if you create those opportunities, give choice to people, uh, I'm a firm believer that they will then realize the promise that they can offer to themselves, their family, their communities. Uh, and everyone will have a different view of what that promise will be for them. But if you don't have the opportunity to demonstrate that promise at the, first, at the front end, uh, it, it really uh, generates the major barrier to anyone having a decent Incredible. Yeah. And you're right. We could go on for quite a bit of time, Mark, you know, addressing all that you've seen that perhaps are barriers to decent work and economic growth and pivoting from that. You recently published an article titled UNGA 76, Building Resilience Through Hope. Will you be able to share with our global audience a little bit about this article and how we can build resilience through hope? Yes, thanks, George. The, you know, the, the tagline uh, for Congress 76 was uh, building resilience 
things to promote. And uh, resilience is a word that we use very commonly now uh, in the sector, uh, and even in the corporate sector. Um, but hope was a curious word for me. It's not one that we see very often, uh, particularly not at formal events like the General Assembly. Um, so I, I kind of reflected on that word, hope. And there's a really heavy degree of humanity in that word. Uh, and what I reflected on um, in looking at that broader tagline for this year's Omnia was we know the barriers, we know the issues, we have our goals, we know what we want to target and prioritize in terms of the issues of, of the day that affect us all and, and individually from many different perspectives. Um, but we also need to be reflective on the humanity that it's just the right thing to do. And if you have a degree of optimism that uh, in the last 20 years, the reduction of poverty, the reduction of hunger, uh, food insecurity, uh, the increase uh, in, in the ability to ensure that childhood mortality is reduced from zero to five years of age. You know, there are many facts out there that shows good progress uh, despite some regression, particularly during the pandemic, that we're all um, very wary and cautious about. But over the last 20 years, you do see uh, definite progress and, uh, and ways to feel optimistic. And you've got to have that ambition. You've got to have that hope that with this roadmap, with this set of SDGs, with this uh, collective uh, call to action, that we will uh, make additional progress despite the overwhelming, uh, at times, you know, insurmountable, it seems, uh, barriers that we have to, to get there. But that hope must remain. So I, I was very taken with the inclusion of that word this year. So I, in, in, the, in the very simple blog I had, I wanted to focus on the policy headline issues for climate change. Uh, if I write, it should be front and center. It's a, a key theme of our age and will remain so for many, many years. Um, obviously, uh, public health and hope needs to be reflected on. But then you want to look at respect. You want to look at respect for our planet. You also want to look at respect for the individual um, and how that manifests itself uh, across the board, across the SDGs, is so crucial. Uh, and we all have a role to play individually, collectively, within the private sector, public sector, and otherwise. Uh, there's an obligation uh, there that I feel as well. Under Mark, you know, your inspiration is contagious. And, you know, I think that when you describe hope within the context of achieving the global goals of connecting those dots and joining those dots, I think it's profound. It's simple to your point, but yet extremely profound. And I'd like to close this interview with asking you, we talked a lot about partnerships during this interview. Is there any element of partnerships that you've seen that help progress your mission specifically at KPMG? And more importantly, for our global audience, can you define exactly what makes a good partner? Yes, uh, so George, uh, I mentioned it earlier about KPMG's view on how we can, can contribute to the SDGs. Um, you know, we have our own responsibility as a global citizen. Um, we have obligations to our employees, our partners, and our communities. Um, but I, I did focus heavily on the services we provide and the, the kind of patchwork variety of clients that we have all around the world. And, and we've um, articulated that uh, into initiative within the firm called KPMG Impact. And we feel that that allows us to prioritize our focus, um, the provision of our services, and how it's aligned to each one of the SDGs is central to how we've established KPMG Impact. And through this initiative, KPMG Impact, which brings all our services to bear and how we have a role to play, partnerships definitely stand out uh, as a key, as a key uh, driver uh, in terms of what we can offer, uh, we can join those dots, we can bring those actors together, uh, we 
have a very privileged um, vantage point uh, where we see all these well-intended individuals, communities, entities all around the world that are our clients um, and making sure that they're aware of each other. So we feel that we have a role to play there in amplifying their great work. Um, and I, so I, I think it's about connection. I think it's about awareness building. And I think it's about um, you know, pulling back to that sense of hope that when you bring all of that to bear, you will achieve more than you ever thought possible right across the 17 years. But I, I, I want to just reflect one thing uh, before I close. Um, somebody asked me to explain the SDGs, and I, and I went through the, the kind of various uh, elements across the 17, and I, uh, I showed them the right icons, and I gave them a sense of what the targets look like and what they focus on. And there's very specific uh, and explicit actions uh, built into the SDG framework, um, and that's to be expected. But what's also there? touched on earlier in the conversation was it also gives a framework for one to understand what your role could be and how it affects in one SDG and could positively impact in another. So the way I phrase it is the SDGs for me are like uh, a code of ethics uh, for humanity. It's like uh, if you work in a corporate, I'm sure everyone who's listening in would have a code of ethics in, in, in their various institutions. And Usually those code of ethics have very specific things that you should do or you should not do. Uh, but what they really provide is a framework, a guidance uh, to give you a sense that whatever the facts and circumstances that you find yourself in, there's a pathway to finding the right thing to do, to give you the right answer. That's how I think the SDGs are now being used. They are used uh, for explicit action, absolutely, and should be. But more broadly, everyone is deciding, okay, my facts and circumstances are this, and how I relate to the SDGs, and how I can be that good citizen, uh, both locally and globally. Uh, this is the framework that I can do that with. And in a way, that gives me the most hope. So with that, uh, I'll close. Well, Mark, you've uh, left me speechless with that, and I will quote you and cite you um describing and and i often describe the global goals is that that glue that keeps the world together it's a it's a north star it's that pin to use an, uh, a golf analogy in the distance you you can see it and you know where you're going and you know what you're working toward and it's apolitical because all 193 member states came together unanimously a point that I always like to remind folks unanimously to agree to these goals. How you get there, we can agree to disagree on some ways you get there, but we can agree that every goal is critically important. And I absolutely love, and again, I will cite you and quote you on the code of ethics for humanity in describing these global goals. I've never heard it put that way. And I must tell you, you've left me speechless. And so with that, Mark Fitzgerald, Global Head of KPMG's International Development Assistance Services, thank you for all you're doing to change the world. Thank you immensely for your time today. Thank you, John.